Well, welcome to our program for March 5th. Uh, you can see uh, today's marching orders. You have uh, next week is transition feeding. One of my favorite ones there. You really got some heavy lifting to do there. There are seven modules that take about uh, 85 minutes. And then there are seven optional modules there as well. So there's lots of reading if you want to do that on the Moodle as far as that goes. But those are the various chapters in the book. Uh, we'll answer questions on forages that came in this week, certainly discussion on phase feeding. And as always, uh, we welcome your questions and comments. But of course, you'll have to sell, send them to me by email because this is a pre-recorded program and I am on my way to Hungary right now. So anyway, uh, send those questions and comments to me by electronic mail or on the Moodle. Either way, you can do that. We had a really good uh, session, uh, forages. Uh, I thought it was straightforward, and a lot of you did very, very well. You can see the homework average, uh, almost, almost six out of uh, 16 you're in, and they're still, they're still coming in right now as we tape this. And the quiz also quite good. Remember, our, our comment is if we can average 5.5 uh, in the homework and uh, 4.5 on the quiz, you've done very, very well, and we've done well, as you can see on these averages. Uh, we did have, uh, I want to make a comment on the form. Uh, I did load up my form on Forge Choices. Uh, if I was going to look at Forge uh, comments here, I would be looking for my high-producing Jersey cows. I'd be looking at uh, two-thirds corn silage, BMR probably, especially if, it's, if it, it has good yields in the parts of the country that it's available in, and one-third legume or small grain, depending on inventory and quality, uh, depending which legumes or grain, small grains I'd go with to me, that's where I would pick them my forage choices. I would store both my legume and small grains in bags, therefore I can control inventory and reduce face, and I also would put the corn silage in bags. I stay with uh, bags because only 200 cows. If I had 400 to 500 cows or higher, I'd really be looking at a pile or a bunker as far as that goes. Piles have too much surface for this small herd size. Bunkers have a very high investment as far as that goes. Plus, if I'm going to be bagging my legume with small grains, I probably will own or have a customer operator that will be providing this service. And of course, uh, bagging allows uh, a smaller harvesting unit. So instead of having to come in with a, a 10 row uh, Kloss or John Deere chopper, uh, I can get by with two or three row choppers, a smaller unit as well. Uh, certainly a question on the straw. Uh, the only challenge we had was how much straw to put in a lactating ration. And uh, we, we had uh, uh, we had people saying they wanted to target five pounds of feed particles over three quarters of an inch in length, but under two inches. That's a good answer. But if that's going to be all straw, then it's too much straw. One thumb rule we've had from uh, Ohio State is one thumb rule of straw functions similar to about three pounds of long hay due to a slow rate of passage. And it'll stay in the room for two or three days. So Therefore, our guideline is less than two pounds, uh, and then that straw should be processed to avoid depressed uh, dry, uh, dry matter uh, intake on those cows. And hopefully, the straw isn't the only forage source in the diet that's going to contribute to three quarters of an inch in length as far as that goes. We have our grid, and again, you can see we're progressing well in the class. Next week is a, is a transition week, and of course, uh, the quiz you have to be done by March 11th and forms done by March 7th. Stay on top, especially the forms. We, uh, we are missing some people on forms. Don't let that get away from you. Our uh, a question on, on phase feeding uh, for this coming, uh, for this week right now, you'll be racking the next couple of days. Allison Dare and Milkland needs your suggestion on why are her heifers, first lactation cows, uh, peaking at 120 days in milk and at 60% of the milk production level of mature cows. Uh, what areas would you explore on Alice's farm to determine if this is good news or bad news and what she may want to examine? Discussion points. We'll spend a few minutes on this part of the program. Uh, if it's in red, we're going to cover that in the PowerPoints here a bit later. So uh, when when should cows peak and what is true peak? And uh, cows should peak ideally. Mature cows are going to peak somewhere around 45 to 75 days in milk. Heifers are now try tending to peak later, typically 90 to 100 to 110 days later. We're not sure if that's because of ramping up dry matter intake or a more maturation of the mammary gland or a customation of the heifers, but they tend to peak a bit later, especially in high producing herds. What is true peak? Well, every cow has to peak. And so uh, if I had a daily milk recording out there, uh, that's one way of getting peak. The other one is DHI. And now we're going to show you a new rule for DHI peak here a bit later. And we'll call it the 260 rule. So certainly if you, if you can measure true peak on a cow, 200, 210 is still a good thumb rule. But uh, DHI obviously is taking one milk yield every 30 days on 
on the farm, the odds of catching that true peak uh, is, is somewhat elusive as well. The next one is RBST on uh, effects on lactation, typically uh, anywhere from 6 to 10 pounds more milk, and dry matter will catch up, but there's a lag, typically, oh, typically two to four weeks. So the cow produces more milk before the dry matter uh, pull increases and brings it up as well. That may not be important information anymore because there's very little RBST being used in the United States, but it is still being used in parts other parts of the world. Uh, efficiency of converting dry matter to milk, more about that a bit later. Uh, what about herds that eat too much dry matter? In other words, you, you look at that and you say, wow, uh, they're eating 50 pounds of dry matter and giving me 55 or 60 pounds of milk. Why is that? That could be a stage of lactation. It could also uh, reflect a uh, too high rate of passage. Manure scores will probably reflect on that as well. It's simply, I mean, we see some of this sometimes in late fall and fall, primarily because cows coming off of heat stress have really gotten thin. And so they're kind of catching up on body condition score at the the same time producing maybe a little bit less milk in mid and late lactation cows. What is a healthy milk fat test? We'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, should cows have to lose body weight? Now, there's a big controversy on that. If you look at some of the newer research, uh, they're suggesting cows that maintain body weight through the first 60, 100 days after calving, they are more fertile. They have better reproductive performance. Some pretty neat work out of the University of Wisconsin. But in most cases, cows are going to lose body weight. We recommend no more than one half body condition score, which is pro approximately about 60 pounds. And that should occur probably over the first 30 days, not the first uh, 20 days uh, and then because we're really losing too much weight if we're losing it over a shorter period of time. And it's not uncommon on farms to see them lose one body condition score. I think the research is pretty clear that you're going to give up some things in uh, fertility and also on animal health if you lose that much weight. So in a perfect world, less than two pounds per day and a maximum of 60 pounds lost uh, in early lactation. And then you may ask, well, how do I determine when cows and positive energy balance? Some farmers are actually weighing cows. And that's good news and bad news. In other words, as they walk out of the parlor, there's an electronic scale system there, and they can weigh those cows going out the parlor. But remember, dry cows are eating 30 pounds of dry matter. Uh, when they get out there in weeks uh, five and six, especially mature cows, they're eating over 50 pounds of dry matter. So it's what I call this room and fill. So how, how do we account for that 20 pounds of dry matter that these cows are now eating in the first uh, five or six weeks as they come up in dry matter intake. And remember, it's not just dry matter. Uh, the rumen is about, uh, rumen fluid is about 85% moisture. So you can multiply that uh, that 20 pounds of dry matter by four plus. So you have another 80 pounds of fill in there as well. So certainly a uh, body condition score would be another way of doing that. Boy, that's tough because you're not going to see those subtle changes occurring in the first couple of, uh, of uh, and basically, week 7, 8, 9, 10, you just aren't going to see it. That's when they're going to start going to positive energy balance. Some people argue when they come into heat. Uh, I think that's pretty crude measurements as far as that goes. Another way would be to uh, monitor milk fat. So cows, milk fat are more typical. More about that in just a few minutes. That might be another indication there. And of course, the, the gold standard would be to actually run some NIFAs, non-esterified non fatty acids, which basically appear in the blood. And when those numbers go up, it means cows and mobilizing body weight. That would be the, the real way to do it, but not many places can measure NEFAs unless they're in a research herd. So that's really pretty, pretty challenging. That was a really important question with RBST because when cows had to be in positive energy balance before they respond uh, correctly to the injection of the bovine somatotropin, uh, the recombinant bovine somatotropin. And so some farmers say, gee, I inject and only 10% of my, 10, 20% of my cows don't respond in milk. And the answer is they're probably negative energy balance. And that's the biology of the cow, literally in the liver in terms of literally saying the cows aren't going to respond to the extra supplementation of that hormone. The last question we'll talk on very briefly, and that is, if you look at the various curves we talked about in the class, there are six groups on a farm or six phases. Should herd, herds have six phases? And the answer is, yes, they should. But if you go out to a dairy farm, farmers are going to say, do you want to come out here and mix, mix six rations uh, every day on a dairy herd? We're lucky we can get uh, 
got three or four of them mixed properly and delivered to the right group. So most herds are going to be looking more of a, a dry cow, both far off and close up. We are really arguing for our fresh cow group. We then like to have a lactating group. And then if you are going to, we're going to lose RBST, we're going to have to really watch body condition score. So if cows don't get pregnant on time, we're going to have the low group or some farmers call them the fat group as far as that goes, which will have a lower energy density, less grain, less protein, no additives and, and go with that. So in some herds, if they are big enough, you're going to find more than six groups because they will group them, as you'll talk about a bit later here in the class, uh, in terms of uh, first lactation animals and older animals in groups, and then they will have far off and uh, close up, and then they'll have fresh groups, and then uh, they'll have uh, the milk production groups from there. Well, what about this new uh, rule? And uh, last year, the North Carolina Processing Center uh, sent us some really neat data we asked them for, and they they were gracious enough to do it. They looked at different levels of Holstein and Jersey productions by basically 2,000 increments. So we looked at Jerseys from 16 to 21,000 pounds of milk, Holsteins from basically 22 to 30,000 pounds of milk. And they gave us both components, which you'll see here in just a few minutes, and they also gave us peak milk on DHI. We we just did the math then, and, and both herds and independent of milk, level of milk production, if you took DHI peak, now remember, that is the peak that was determined that one day snapshot when that person was there recording milk yields, multiplied by 260. So DHI peak multiplied by 260 should estimate the amount of milk that cow should produce in that lactation cycle, either Jersey or Holstein. So if a cow peaks at 100 pounds on DHI multiplied by 260 and potentially she should reach about 26,000 pounds of milk in that lactation cycle if she stays on the normal persistency and milk lactation curve. Kind of a neat number. Well, now let's switch gears, take a quick look at milk components. Every year in the August issue of Hordes Dairymen, they put out the breed averages. This is DHIR, which is the official herds that are paying a small extra fee to get more complete records and extended records. Uh, notice uh, this is what the breeds would be. You can look at them. Notice I got the Holstein in red and that's the only big change that's occurred in this last year. We're up about a tenth of a percent on Holstein. That used to be about religiously 3.65 to 3.72, now 3.84. So we are getting more butter fat and of course that probably reflects some of the marketing situation as well. If you take and divide the fat into the protein, that's 81% or if you divide the protein into the fat, that's 1.26 now, remember that 1.26, uh, that's a normal number for Holsteins if you do the, the pr pr protein fat ratio versus the fat protein ratio. But that would be normal for the various breeds. You see they jump around a little bit. You can see uh, the highest one is brown Swiss, and that's the good news. They'll make more cheese from, uh, from, uh, uh, from brown Swiss milk than they will any other breed. You'll see the Jerseys have, the Guernseys have the lowest number, and that's just kind of a breed characteristic. So that's a nice benchmark to look at to see is – the breed that I have in my farms producing components that we'd expect them to see. And I would guess this would work well for my Canadian colleagues as well. Here we take uh, that uh, some data again from Horns Dairyman, that same table, and look at uh, the breeds by breaking it down into pounds of fat and pounds of protein. And you can see, again, these herds jump around a little bit. There's always an argument which cows are going to make the most money. If you look at strictly pounds of fat and pounds of protein, which is what's marketed here in the U.S., uh, most of our milk is marketed in the U.S., you can see uh, the average DHIR Holsteins were producing 25,000 pounds of milk. That's a mature equivalent number, just so you're aware of that. Uh, almost five, about five pounds of fat and protein. And now you see jerseys at four and a half. My quick math says these jerseys have to produce about 1,500 pounds more milk to catch up with those Holsteins at that level of production. Uh, the real target, I think our good dairymen are looking at are 90 pounds of milk, which means they're going to get about six pounds of solids. And our very best herd in northern Illinois produces just, just a little over seven pounds. They're averaging about 106 pounds with a four butterfat test and and a 3-2 protein. So again, remember, this protein is true protein, unlike the Canadians, Mexican, and other parts of the world that use total accrued protein levels in the milk. So another nice benchmark. Uh, are you getting five pounds? That means you're average, <coughs> but <coughs> going to be tight. Are you getting uh, six pounds of fat and protein, or are you getting seven? And obviously, uh, um, it tracks pretty much with both the component and also the breed that you have. Here's another look at some of that data that came out of North Carolina that I thought was just
is fascinating. And we look at um, th- three different groups of Holstein cows, 23,000 pounds. There's probably 1,000 plus herds in each of these categories, not quite that many in the 30,000 pound category. And then we looked at mature cows, which are third plus and first lactation. We looked in the first 40 days, and you can see butterfat tests are modestly high. That means those cows are losing body weight with butterfat tests above breed average. There's your milk protein in blue. So notice it's really low. That should be about a 3-1, and it's a 2-9. So uh, we aren't getting the amino acids there in the first 40 days. The next 40 days, we still aren't getting it there. And I'm just looking at the at the, the 30 line over here. So you can see the very high fat over here. The protein still stays low, but now the fat comes back more to normal. So these cows are probably now in positive energy balance in the sense of looking at milk fat test as far as that goes. You have, well, what happens beyond 100 days? It's all normal, folks. And in fact, if you get out to about 200 plus days, uh, the, the fat test sits up at 3738. So that's pretty interesting. So anyway, you can see in the first 100 days, it looks like we're really tight on amino acids for these dairy cows. And it looks like these, these cows are losing body weight, both the young cows and the older cows. I said, well, that shouldn't make any difference. Let's go down to the average herd here in the U.S. And sure enough, you can see they're suffering to, to low, uh, smaller extent, but the heifers are getting hammered a little bit more. Look at the protein over here, even lower over here. And that same trend, I thought with the lower milk production that maybe they were getting more amino acids. But again, that could reflect dry matter intake, management on the farm, a number of other factors as well. Pretty neat stuff. We're going to see this pop up in one of the farm magazines here uh, later this spring. So what does this mean to a dairy farmer in Illinois? This is an actual herd in Illinois, northern Illinois. They were averaging 70 pounds of milk with a 3-5 butterfat test, 2.9 protein. Now, if you and I as nutritionists, veterinarians, consultants, can get that number up to a normal 3-7, or we would almost argue 3-8, 3-7 and 3 oh, words, adds two-tenths of a point of fat, a tenth of a point of true protein. Using the prices in January 2018, $2.45 for fat. That's an extra 34 cents per cow per day. If I get that tenth of a point on protein, Averaging 70 pounds of milk, I pick up another. Uh, I pick up another 12 cents, so I can make another 46 cents per cow per day if I can get components back to normal. I'm not saying above normal, just getting back to normal here. So be well aware of that as well. Now remember, uh, the Canadians on the protein, your protein is going to be two tenths of a point higher than us because you are up also capturing not only casein and uh, and whey proteins, but you're also capturing mercury and nitrogen, which we talked about earlier here in the class. So what about healthy cows? Well, here's two different PowerPoints to look at. I like this one. If true protein is two-tenths of a point higher than milk fat, an inversion has has occurred. I call it milk fat inversions. Now, you Canadian and Mexican colleagues, that would be four-tenths for you because you're using crude protein instead of true protein. So, for an example, if I had a cow, uh, or you'll never see a bulk tank, I hope, but a a cow or a group of cows that had a three true protein, which is uh, pretty good for Holsteins, and milk fat was 2.8. Now, that cow is inverted. If you go down your DHI sheet and circle every cow that's inverted using whatever criteria you want to use, if over 10% of the herd is inverted, look for rumen acidosis or other factors that's going on on the dairy farm. Another way to approach that is look at the Wisconsin Transition Score Index. Uh, what that does is looking at the ratio of uh, milk protein to milk fat. Remember, at a Holstein, that should be 1.26. And they use uh, milk components. They use somatic cell count in the first uh, first uh, uh, d- test on DHI. They look at uh, total milk production, previous milk production, and they come up with a score. And that's been very popular used at the Wisconsin Processing Center. That is not available in some other processing centers because it is copyrighted, restricted to Wisconsin dairy herds. So if you have a value over 1.4, that to me reflects fat mobilization, and you're probably seeing elevated NEFAs, which of course will be a milk fat precursor to produce milk fat. Now, there's some examples in the bottom. If I had cows that had a 4.2 butter fat and a 3 protein, or cows with 4.5 fat and 3.2 uh, true protein, those would be all uh, hammered or dinged, or would be a negative V view scored in the Wisconsin transition score. My thumb rule is if you got Holstein cows and the herd first day on DHI test and they're over 4.5, kitty bar the door because I, I think you're you're putting these cows at risk as well. 
What about going back and looking at the entire herd? If you look at your entire herd, if you look at that milk fat to milk protein ratio for Holsteins, if it's over 0.9, which means now your butter fat test is relatively low compared to your protein test, you're missing milk fat. And those are the areas I'd look at to try to pick up that fat. You're feeding too much polyunsaturated fat or PUFAs, ruminant acidosis, shortage of feed intake, a shortage of energy. However, if that ratio is under 0.75, now your cows are missing protein. And boy, both of them will affect your milk check. And if you're short on milk protein, look for amino acid shortages or imbalances, a lack of microbial amino acid production, or a lack of high quality RUP, which of course you now know is rumen undegraded protein. Powerful tools, powerful tools to look at your herd. And we have a number of young dairymen here in my class, uh, and dairy ladies in my class, certainly a, a good one to take a look at both individually and on the bulk tank as well. How much variation in components? Some of you may recognize this name. Dr. Jeff Renault published this work several years ago. He looked at 1,500 Minnesota dairy herds, and he looked at the normal fat test variation was about six hundredths of a point. And you can see the range goes all the way from five hundredths to one-tenth of a point. That's an important question. How much jumping around do you see? Milk protein, you can see, it goes around a point, uh, 0 0.037 a units, so a much tighter range. So the question is, how much does your uh, pickups and every and and you and, and many of our milk plants now in the U.S. every load every other day or every day that fat protein somatic cell and milk and nitrogen values are given back to you at the end of the month. Take a look at them, and if you got a very simple statistic uh, program on your computer, you can actually do a, a, a standard deviation. Uh, Dick Wallace pulled this data together. This is the University of Illinois herd. On the bottom, on the green down here, you can see is milk protein, uh, and then you can see the red. That would be milk fat. And you can see um, certainly different peaks. If you look at the months, you can see the good peaks are going to be in the winter. Uh, the low peaks uh, in both uh, protein and fat are going to occur in the summer, which means we got a problem on the farm with heat stress abatement on those cows. The other thing to notice, the protein's pretty tight. doesn't jump around, but look at the butter fats. They are all over the map. And this is bulk tank milk. So it's not like DHI where you're taking a sample, do they invert the, the tube, do they mix it well, do they get too much uh, early milk or late milk? Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So the red dots scare me, the green dots look uh, pretty pretty typical as far as that goes. The other thing Dr. Wallace did is put the, the, the point, uh, point 0.8, uh, two. that's kind of the normal fat protein ratio, that's the green line. So it says this: these Holstein cows should be hugging this green line. And again, you can see where she tends to drop off here and then other times of the year it goes up. And so that's looking at the, the milk fat, milk protein ratio. So again, nice tools for those of you that are veterinarians, consultants, feed company or dairy uh, managers to look at on your herds. What about this milk fat uh, composition? This is some brand new stuff that you can actually go to the Hordes webinar and learn a lot more about. Uh, these, these slides you can see are in a red and white. That is Cornell red and white because these are Dave Barbano's uh, PowerPoints. When you look at milk fat, you basically made up of a, of a glycerol molecule, and that's this red over here, and then three fatty acids. And the question is, which three fatty acids are over here in this triglyceride? That's how the cow secretes milk fat, and that's what makes butter when you churn it. And he looks here, there are two sources. One is called need de novo, de novo fat and fatty acid synthesis. That means the cow makes it. And so she eats the feed. She makes rumen VFAs, primarily acetate and propionate. I then go to the mammary gland via the bloodstream, and the mammary gland makes milk fat in the mammary gland and, of course, makes and it produces the milk fat. That, about 50% of the milk fat comes this route. Another source that you and I will call preformed, or he calls preformed fatty acids, and that includes what's coming from the feed stuff. This would be your fuzzy cotton seed. This would be your Megalac, your Energy Booster, your Energy 2 products out there, animal fats. And then, of course, adipose tissue. If we're mobilizing uh, animal, animal fat, we break that down into chylomicron. And then, of course, they end up going to the mammary gland. And if, uh, let me excuse me, chylomicron comes from the feed. Nephas come from the fat. They go to the mammary gland. And they're there they are going to be pre uh, made into fatty acids and make milk fat. About 50% comes from that. So if you got the rumen working right and you add if, add fat to the diet and you got the right types of fat, milk fat tests should go up and could go up. And so what they're doing is looking at the ratio of de novo, 
which is synthesized, and these are the fatty acids, uh, four carbon, eight carbon, 14 carbon fatty acids. Mixed means that either it comes being made by the cow or it comes from preformed sources. So some of you are feeding the palm fatty acids um, uh, that comes from Europe, especially that's C16. So you, if you're feeding, uh, if you're feeding that, then th th this number should go up over here. Uh, these are also coming, uh, basically uh, the C18 ones that could be coming uh, from some of the uh, energy booster type products out there as well. And now you can look at these ratios. And so what they're doing, they are looking at bulk tanks in New York State and discovering these ratios do not always come out the same. And they've got some very nice guidelines. And if you go to the hordes. Dairyman webinar last year. Dave Barbano, you can hear a full 40-minute talk on how they're interpreting it, and he can show you the data as far as that goes. So a tool that's coming, and I think more of our DHI centers will do this. It takes a certain, uh, I believe it's a delta instead of a FOSS unit to do this. So uh, I know uh, some labs cannot do this, but the, the New York DHI, uh, excuse me, the Minnesota DHIA can do it, and so can uh, the Cornell uh, labs and also the Minor Institute labs can do these analysis. I think the real power students are going to be that you're going to look at individual fats on cows, especially in early lactation, because then that answers the question, you know, are we seeing, because this would be somewhat, uh, the, the preformed, uh, the NEFA would be almost a, a marker, if you wish, that we could use in milk fat to say, are these cows losing body weight? Pretty exciting times. Well, not only did that, but Miner then went out and said, well, does things on the farm, can that affect uh, the, the, these ratios? And they said, yep, we found uh, four of them. Uh, the first one is less bunk space, and they define that as less than eight, 18 inches. We saw a lower amount of de novo synthesis, probably reflects lower dry matter intake. If we crowded the cows, which means more than 1.1 cows per stall, that probably ties into the feed bunk as well. We also saw the same thing. So one and two may reflect some of the same thinking. Stocking rates mean lying down time. If we had higher uh, ether extract, that's a nice way for saying fats and oils, as you all know in here, we also saw lower de novo synthesis because we saw more preform coming in. That may not be a problem. It may simply saying that's what it should be. And then if you uh, had uh, higher levels of physically effective NDF, that means long particle size, could be straw, could be long. Uh, kernel uh, could be a uh, shred late, something like that. They saw higher amounts of de novo synthesis in those cows as well. And those were the, the different levels they looked at, how they were expressing their value as high as uh, far as PENDF. I'm not sure if that's Penn State or they're using some other ones as well. That was statistically significant, and they picked this up on, on farm visits when they went out and visited some of these farms that had unusual numbers on this fat test. Another thing we want to talk about is feed efficiency. I think what a powerful tool. Feed efficiency simply is uh, critical because feed is the largest cost of production, making up anywhere from 50 to 65 percent of the cost of producing milk, although it is down a little bit now because corn, uh, corn is cheaper, alfalfa is up, is up, corn size is cheaper as well. Again, um, we, trying to feed the most dry matter may, always, may not always be the most economical place to be. Uh, waybacks are controversial. Uh, we see farmers that have no waybacks. And here at the university, we go to 10% because that's what it has to be, which means if cows are eating 50 pounds of dry matter, we got to put 55 pounds in front of them to make sure they can always eat that as much feed as they want. And of course, usually that wayback then ends up going to steers is what we do here at the U of I. Feed efficiency is kind of the measurement for livestock. For all these different ones, it simply says what what type of product do you get out of an animal for the amount of feed invested in it. And if you look at data from around the United States, we'll go to farms and we'll see lactating cows going below one. That's bad news. That means you're getting a pound of dry matter per pound of milk or as high as two, and that's extremely high efficiency. And so we're really looking at feed intake. I love this slide. I want to repeat it because factors that affect dry matter intake and that leads to the feed efficiency would be number one, the veil availability of the feed in terms of in the bunk or heat stress or lameness. Number two, it looks at balanced rations and VFA and fat levels and rations and rumen pHs. And three is fill factors. In other words, do we have too much undigestible NDF in the diet? So certainly if, if the dry matter intake is too high or too low, we are violating one of these three uh, circles from the University of Wisconsin. 
So here's definitions of feed efficiency is a pounds of 3.5 fat corrected milk divided by the pounds of dry matter consumed. Consumed is underlined because you have to reduce or remove the way back if they don't eat it. Uh, you don't charge them for it in this in this calculation, and it's 3.5 because it's pretty much correct, uh, calculated back to milk fat for, for Holsteins. So it's not 4%, it's 3.5. The formula is on the bottom, down here at the bottom, and you can, you, you, you can see that uh, it's, it's pounds of milk times the constant. And be careful, this is pounds of milk fat, not pounds of of uh, not percent, it's milk fat, pounds of milk fat. Here would be an example of a cow, group of cows were giving 75 pounds of 3.5 fat corrected milk and they, they were consuming 50 pounds of dry matter, that'd be 1.5. If your milk here would be 78, uh, let, let, let's, let, let's say it's uh, uh, 75 pounds with a 3.8, well, for every tenth of a point, for Holsteins, you can add another tenth of a point to 1.5. So if this 75 pounds of milk was 3.8, if you don't want to go through the calculations, uh, which aren't very difficult, this would be about 1.8 feet efficiency. And here's our guidelines. Mature cows over 1.7. When you get over 2, biologically, she has to be losing body weight. So anything over 1.8 to 1.9, now metabolically, she is mobilizing body, body fat to get the job done. Notice the heifers are down 1.6. About a tenth of a point because some of those dry matters is going to be used for growth on these younger animals. So again, if this spread is more than a tenth of a point, now you have done a poor job of raising heifers. Low groups are much lower just because they eat more feed, they're gaining body weight, they're pregnant, uh, the, the, you got other uses for that dry matter over here. An entire herd, 1.5 is a nice benchmark to work with. Fresh cows, I'd like to be under 1.5 because then that means we're getting excellent dry matter intakes here. Here. And if the herd is at 1.3, you have to ask what's going on. And generally speaking, that reflects poor reproductive performance and too many cows getting long in lactation, which really drops feed efficiency. Here are your uh, two formulas again if you want them. This is 3 5 fat corrected milk. Energy corrected milk, you will see it includes both milk, milk fat, and true protein. So again, uh, <coughs> Excuse me, if you want to go to energy corrected milk, that's where it's at. Now, this slide simply says, I would suggest it's not worth all your extra effort. What Jim did, uh, did on this is take 60 pounds of milk, and the top one is is basically a whole, is a Jersey milk. The middle one is brown Swiss. The bottom one is Holstein milk. Using those fat and protein levels there, you can come over here and you can see, if we took it to Jersey, a, a roughly 69, almost 70 pounds of 3 to 5 fat corrected milk. If I go back and go to energy corrected milk, it really doesn't change uh, at all. Uh, you come down to the brown Swiss, it doesn't hardly change at all either. And here comes the Holstein. What does change, of course, is... Is Jersey milk, you can see with a 4.5, is worth about 10 pounds more milk than uh, the Holstein milk. And there's that, that, that thumb rule we talked about earlier. So that's why I, I stay with uh, basically 3.5 cracked and fat corrected milk and using my thumb rules rather than energy corrected milk because you don't really gain anything. Now, if you have a Holstein herd, let's say that's got a, 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 a 4 butter fat and a 3.4 milk protein, you better use energy corrected because that'd be an unusual uh, components for. Holstein herd. Uh, Norman St. Pierre put this table together several years ago from The Ohio State University. He looks at feed efficiencies and he looks at actually milk yield. So this is pounds of milk. So if you've got an 80 pound tank average, you'd have a feed efficiency 1.54. Now be careful, he uses 3.6. Remember my thumb rule, that'd be 1.64. So I had a tenth of a point to each of these if you're going to be using, because he based his over off a 1,500 pound cow. That's not a big factor, but th this is important. He used 3.6. I'm not sure why, but that's what he did. Now, what about economics and feed efficiency? Well, here's an interesting calculation. If I got a 70, pi 70 pounds of milk and dry matter is 9 cents a pound of dry matter, remember earlier in this class we said it's probably close to 9, cent 9 cents instead of 10 cents, but today we're going to use 10 cents because you can see the math. If I get the same 75 pound 70 pounds of milk uh, with a feed efficiency 1.3, it would take 54 pounds of dry matter. If I do 1.4, that's where a lot of herds in, in the Midwest are at. Uh, that'd be 50. My good herds are at 1.5. takes 47 pounds of dry matter. So that difference you can see here is 40 cents. So if I get my feed efficiency up to a, a modest 1.4 or to the target 1.5, you can see I have an extra 30 cents. Or if I went from here to there, 
an extra 70 cents per cow per day. Huge, huge factor out there in the program. So what's going to affect feed efficiency? Well, the answer is a lot of factors. And so this table will list them all for you. And if you are a really good uh, nutritionist, you could tell me why, if I picked one out, why feed efficiency uh, would be different. Uh, but uh, for far as the, the bit, what I call the big ones, feed digestibility is huge, really huge. So if you have more digestible forages, uh, you have more grains, more starch, more sugar, this number always should always go up as long as the rumen is healthy. Days and milk will always be a winner because for every one more day the cow is longer in the lactation, Wisconsin researchers suggest about two tenths of a pound less milk. So here I've lost I've lost milk. These two go together. Uh, feed digestibility and forage quality are, are huge factors, and we already talked about that in our forage one. Somatic cell count, we now have seen some new data coming out that somatic cell counts actually, if double somatic cell counts are cut in half, the new data Wisconsin says you're going to probably gain about two pounds, two and a half pounds more milk, and it'll be you have more milk with higher producing herds. So it's not a constant number. Higher herds will react differently. And then, of course, rumen acidosis, which means we aren't digesting feed properly. We're not getting good fiber utilization. We're not having the right rate of passages. And that all affects feed efficiency. So all these things become factors on feed efficiency. So if your number is slightly below target, look at this list and see where you're going. So how do you measure it on a farm? Well, the really good way is option one is to actually measure it when you've got the dry matter intakes there and you've got milk yield. And I'll show you a herd here in Illinois, some data that we got a couple of years ago. Number two is the KISS method, which means you're going to estimate that using the milk, uh, the DHI or bulk tank levels, the ration dry matters that are coming there and correcting for intake, and then any way backs you have there, you can get a rough approximation as well. So here is an excellent example. Wow, this is this a powerful set? You may want to come back and study this because we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you can see this is a very large herd. Uh, their milking parlor can handle 400 cows because you can see they're, they're grouped in groups of 400 uh, cows over here. So he's got four groups of cows on this farm. So uh, we've got... Uh, you can, you can see the numbers. Uh, here is the dry matter intakes because he's got a weighing device on his TMR mixer. Electronically feeds that in. So, <coughs> excuse me, you can see on, uh, on pen one, uh, they're eating 58 pounds of dry matter. Days and milk is 50. So this is his fresh pen. This is one of his freshest pen that he has out there. 56 days in milk. Uh, they're averaging 121 pounds of milk, roughly 58 pounds of dry matter. Uh, feed efficiency 2.1. You're right. They're losing weight. And if you walk out and look at his fresh pen, then look at his dry cows, you can see they're dropping at least one body condition score or at least three quarters of a score. Here we go to the next group of cows. And uh, you can see uh, 148 days in milk. Again, now we have a much more desirable number. Here we got um, a tail end, uh, more tail end cows, uh, 357 days, 1.3. These are very inefficient cows, but uh, they're probably gaining body weight. Here's another group, um, another uh, later lactation group. Uh, this this one's still making me some pretty good money. He had three groups of heifers. The heifers had it figured out. You can see their feed efficiency is spot on, right where you'd want them to be. Here's his hospital pen. These are cows that are are are. are um, or in this hospital pen, probably being drug treated, uh, or or maybe even uh, fresh cows. You know, feed efficiency is down there. Sixty-two days, it wouldn't be a lot of fresh cows. Here's this mastitis pen. It's killing them. It's killing them. So these two pens are just really hammering them. And so the discussion at the farm was how do we reduce this and how do we correct this number over here? That one says he got to get more dry matter into those cows. Powerful, powerful slide. And he gets this every day, students, because he's got a milk flow meter in his parlor. So he knows exactly when the next pen comes in, that data is automatically sent to the computer. The feed company and the feed truck automatically sends it to his uh, computer as well. Every day he gets this. And so he does a weekly average. So he wants to look at is there changes in these pens every week? And then he does a monthly average as well. What a powerful, powerful tool he has. Well, feed efficiency, we're going to see more about this. Uh, I can think of... Uh, Feed efficiency. 
Uh, we can uh, look at uh, other measurements. Uh, we're talking pretty much about energy feed efficiency here. We call it dry matter. We might want to call it energy, but we might want to express that as mcals instead of pounds of dry matter or megajoules. Uh, megajoules per unit of milk or milk per unit of megajoules or mcal. So I think we'll see energy comers coming in. I think it'll be similar to dry matter. Protein efficiency will become more important. Right now, we have got 28%. We may reach this up to 40%. If you go to New Zealand, they look at milk solids per acre or per hectare because, again, land becomes another unit of importance on, on the dairy farm. A nice table put together by Michigan State looks at the typical energy efficiencies for whole farm. Energy is 21%. Protein is 28%. Now, how can you and I change that? Well, if you increase milk production by 10%, you can add 0.7 to this number here. So now it becomes 21.7. This one becomes 28.4. If I increase a longevity, older cows, again, I increase these numbers. Reduce the age of first calving to by two months. I get increased feed efficiency because I don't have that feed going into the growing heifers at that point. If I reduce the calving interval by one month, notice a nice increase we get on feed efficiency. If I reduce dietary protein by two percentage points, I get a nice increase. It doesn't change energy because remember, protein doesn't drive energy efficiency. It could have, unless it indirectly affects milk production, a big jump here. But look at the bottom line still, folks. If I reduce feed waste by 10%, and that's common on a lot of farms. You look at shrink and feed losses, energy increases by 2.3% protein by 3.1. So if you're looking at the, 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 the big fish to fry, all of these are important, but you can see feed shrink or feed waste is big. Uh, protein levels are big, and we know that already as we talked about earlier here in the class, and that's important as well. Well, that completes our discussion for today. Hopefully, you'll have a chance sometime uh, this week uh, to listen to this. Uh, my apologies. Uh, it just was too dangerous, dangerous in the sense of I had to get to, an, you know, to my desktop computer on an Internet somewhere around Chicago. And uh, that was going to be a real problem at 5 o'clock in rush hour traffic as far as that goes. Our form for the transition feeding, having a, when you start listening to that, again, back to Dan Derryman. He's building a new dairy ration. And uh, he's asking you, should he plan to have uh, a dry cow, far-off dry cow, a close-up dry cow, a fresh cow group for both his pregnant heifers, first lactation cows, and older cows? Uh, what would you suggest? Uh, should he do this? Uh, what two questions would you ask Dan? I can think of four of them right now. I would ask Dan. But then why? what two questions would you ask Dan before you make your recommendation? Then why would you ask these two questions? So with that, uh, we don't have to ask if there are any questions out there because obviously you're listening to this pre-recorded program here. My thanks to Jim Baltz for allowing me to do it this way. We'll have this uh, posted and hopefully you'll have a chance uh, this uh, Monday or sometime uh, in this coming week to, to listen to this program. We'll see you back here in Champaign here in about uh, two weeks. Have a good one.